All right. So at this point, we need to talk about cells. So up to now, most of what we've talked about, some exception, um, minimal emphasis in terms of what you need for your exam. Now we start in the more important stuff. That being said, just as a preview for this, my exams are big picture exams. I'm not looking for you to memorize minutia. I'm looking for you to be able to apply the large concept of how things work. So with that, let's begin. So the cells are the units of life. Anything that's alive is made of cells. It's able to reproduce. It has a metabolism. It reacts to stimuli. It has some form of development. And it maintains homeostasis. So weird things like barnacles are actually alive, like, you know, like a little worm thing or something. I don't know. Um, but viruses are not. Drake's virus is hard to kill. You, it's really hard to kill something that was never alive to begin with. Viruses are infectious genetic material, but they're not made of cells. So right off the bat, they're not alive. But even then, they're not able to reproduce. Viruses don't reproduce. You reproduce the virus. Your DNA makes the virus. It inserts the DNA into yours, and then you make copies of the virus. It doesn't have a metabolism. They don't use resources to maintain homeostasis. They have no development, they just, you produce them. So not alive. All right, so one thing with cells is cell theory. And cell theory, again, when I say theory, oops, it's not working. Oh, so when I say theory, um, in science, when we say theory, it's a big, big picture idea. It's it's a summary of like everything we know. It's not my best guess. We don't use theory the same way that you would in everyday language. In science, we say theory. We mean this is what we know. So when you hear like the theory of uh, relativity, then that's how stuff works. Or, when I talk about sliding filament theory or cell theory, I'm not guessing at what cells are. This is what cells are. But in science, because science is always changing, we don't say cell fact or whatever, it's cell theory, because we're always adding and changing stuff. But anyway, the biggest part of this is that the cell is the smallest unit of life. There's another little pieces inside the cell that are by themselves alive. Um, the functions of any organ or organism depends on the functions of the cells. And the activities of the cells then are dictated by the stuff inside the cells. This comes back to our big idea of structure and function complementing one another. And cells only come from other cells. They don't just randomly pop into being. There were 200 different types of people cells. There's big cells and little cells. Long cells, short cells, cells that move, cells that don't. Lots and lots of cells. Here are some of the cellular diversity inside you. So red blood cells, and sperm cells, lots of different cells. You get the point. Now, we're going to be talking about sort of the generalized cell. All cells have some similar functions and pieces, and that's sort of what we're talking about. So, things we need. People cells have three big things. A plasma membrane that separates the inside and the outside of the cell. Cytoplasm, all the stuff that's on the inside. And most cells will have a nucleus. Here's our sort of generalized cell. This is a cell with all the parts. Then all your cells have all the parts, but this one does. The plasma membrane separates the outside from the inside of the cell. It is a phospholipid bilayer. It's often described as a fluid mosaic. Fluid because it changes, and mosaic because there are other molecules embedded here to make up this mosaic. Terms that we're going to be using 
intracellular fluid is on the inside, extracellular fluid is on the outside. If we ever use the term interstitial fluid, that's still outside the cells, but it's inside the tissues, it's, it's in between the cells. So here's our plasma membrane. We've got phospholipids and proteins and cholesterol and carbohydrates embedded in that phospholipid bilayer. Most of the lipids you find in the membrane are phospholipids. Now, the phospholipid has a, a phosphate head, little round things here, and then fatty acid tails. The phosphate head is polar, and so it's hydrophilic or water soluble. Fatty acid tail is nonpolar. They're hydrophobic. And so what you get here is a molecule that has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. It's an amphipathic molecule. So now the structure of your cell membrane, hydrophilic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. It's kind of like an Oreo. Cookie on the outside, cookie on the other side, lard in the middle. So, phospholipid bilayer. There's some glycolipids and there's some cholesterol that's stuck in the cell membrane as well. Lots and lots of proteins stuck in the membrane. They will be how cells communicate, um, how they do work, and how they move stuff in and out of the cell. These membrane work through proteins are a lot of how cells function. And we'll be talking a lot about them as we go through the different systems. Some of them are just kind of loosely stuck to the outside. Some of them go all the way through. They may be enzymes or they may help stuff move. There's lots of functions here. And so here we see these proteins. Notice this one's got a hole in it that makes that one a channel protein. This one's connected to something on the inside, set off a chain reaction. So lots of function there. Things we do, transport. Let's look at that, or transport. Moving something in or out of the cell. That was easy. As a receptor for a signal. Chemical signals, like neurotransmitters and hormones, are proteins. They're very specific in that tertiary shape or the three-dimensional shape of the protein, and they bind to a specific receptor protein. So there is a receptor for that signal attaching the cell to something else that's outside the cell. So here we're attached to the extracellular matrix, the supports that are outside the cell. Other cell functions, there may be enzymes, they may hold cells together, they may be involved in how cells recognize one another. Here's an enzyme carrying out a chemical reaction. Here's a cell adhesion molecule holding cells together. And then here is cell recognition. So you'd have like a cell of the immune system that would recognize like this little carbohydrate tag. We also hold cells together. And there are three major types of membrane junctions. Tight junctions, which is just what they sound like. They hold the cells really tightly together so that junk can't go in between them. A desmosome zone is like a spot weld in between the cells. They're anchoring the cells together. They're not necessarily preventing leakage, but they do prevent the cells from ripping apart. And a gap junction is straight up an electrical connection between the cells. So then an electrical impulse travels from one cell to the next. So here is a tight junction. Nothing's going in between those cells. They're held really tightly together. Here is a desmosome. You can apply tension to those cells, but you're not ripping them apart. And then here is a gap junction. An electrical impulse that started here would travel from one cell to the next. They're all electrically connected. The plasma membrane is not a barrier barrier. It is what we call selectively permeable means that some stuff can get through the membrane and some stuff can't. 
there are two types of membrane transport, of moving stuff in and out of the cell. Passive transport does not require energy. In passive transport, we say that stuff moves with its gradient or down the gradient, meaning it moves from high to low concentration. Active transport requires energy. Here we're moving stuff from low to high concentration. So let's look at passive transport. No energy required. Now, some stuff can just freely cross that cell membrane. It doesn't need any help at all. Things that are lipid soluble freely cross the membrane. And you need to remember that. Lipids freely cross the cell membrane. That is called diffusion, simple diffusion. So here we see simple diffusion of a lipid across the membrane. So this would be like this lipid soluble thing here. That would be something like steroid straight to the membrane. Doesn't need any help doesn't need any advice. It's just going to go from high to low concentration. So diffusion is fat soluble molecules diffusing across that membrane. Well, obviously the cell is going to need more than just lipids moving across the membrane, right? We've got to move glucose and other stuff. So then we have what's called facilitated diffusion. Facilitated means that it's going to use a protein that's stuck in the membrane to move stuff. Certain things that are lipophobic, like glucose and amino acids and stuff, use a carrier protein or a channel protein to cross that membrane. Now, a carrier protein will grab onto something and pull it in. Our cardinal rule of proteins is that when proteins bind to something, they change shape. So this carrier protein will bind to something that's either in or out of the cell, and in changing the shape, it moves it the opposite direction. Now, there's no energy required in this conformation change, so this is still passive transport. A channel protein is just what it sounds like. It's a channel. In either of these cases, it is very specific. These carrier proteins are not binding to everything, and these channel proteins are very specific for molecules. When you think about those channel proteins, if you have kids, think about the shape ball that people bought them when they were a baby, that stupid ball. It's got all the different little tiny shapes that you're going to lose. And they have to put like the round block and the round hole and the square block and the square hole, triangle block and the triangle hole, and the like pentagram block or whatever in that, in case you've got like that shape ball or whatever, um, right? All these, these shapes have to go in the right hole. And, and that's how you know if your kid's going to college, right? So they're trying to put the circle hole, the circle block and the star hole, your hose, right? Oh, better hope they're good at sports. If they're trying to put the circle block in the square hole and they've got a hammer, you're set. At least they're, you know, dedicated. But the principle is the same here, right? Instead of like a shape ball or whatever, you've got a cell and it's got this protein that's got a sodium shaped hole in it. So only sodium is going through that little channel. So they're specific. And they can be saturated, which means there's a finite number of them in the membrane. If the, you've got one channel for sodium, there's only so much sodium you're getting into that cell. It's like opening one door into a concert. You can only get so many people in through one door at a time. So you can saturate these channels. Lastly, the cell can regulate these channels. It can make more of them. It can make less of them. So here is a facilitated diffusion example using a carrier protein. Here, when the protein binds to something that's outside the cell, it changes shape and that brings it into the cell. This is still passive transport. There's no energy or ATP being used and we're still going from high concentration to low concentration. Channel proteins we have both leakage channels and gated channels. A leakage channel is always open. A gated channel, you have to provide something to open it. Either a chemical or an electrical signal opens that channel. So here is a, a facilitated diffusion through a, a leakage channel, right? And that's a, whatever that red sphere is, it's perfectly shaped to go through that hole. The last time a passive transport we'll talk about is osmosis, and osmosis is the diffusion of water. Now here's the thing, 
everything's dissolved in water. So how does water diffuse if it's what everything is dissolved in? Well, water can go through that plasma membrane and there are specific channels for water called aquaporins. Here is the rule for water. And so there you see water moving through that channel through the membrane. Here's the rule for water. Water always follows stuff around. When something moves, when a molecule moves, water follows it. Water concentration is determined by solute concentration. Water follows stuff around. Water will move to the higher concentration level. It's called osmolarity. And if we separate solutions of different concentration, water will move. Let's look. So here is this, this experiment that's done. So we have this U-shaped, horseshoe-shaped tube. Now, we have these little molecules of salt or sugar or whatever in the water. And here we have a membrane that has a red dot sized hole right there. And so you can see like, my little laser red dot can go straight through there. It's great. So what happens is that these particles diffuse, right? They go from high concentration to low concentration. They move through that little hole. Everything's happy. But what if we shrink the hole on that membrane right there so that these little red dots can't fit through? Well, if we do that, now the little red dots can't go through. So what happens is that the water moves. Water follows stuff around. Water moves toward osmolarity or concentration. Examples. Let's look. When osmosis occurs with cells, you're either going to gain volume or lose volume, and this is going to suck. You don't want this to happen. Tonicity is the ability of a solution to make that happen. Your cells are in an isotonic solution, meaning that the fluid outside the cells has the same concentration as the fluid inside the cells. So water is not moving in or out in net gain or loss. Hypertonic is when there's more stuff on the outside than there is on the inside. So take a snail and pour salt on it for science. Again, disclaimer, if I say it's for science, it's not cruelty, it's for science. So take a snail and pour salt on it. What happens to the snail? All the water leaves the snail's body. It doesn't have skin. It's got a semi-permeable membrane. So all the water rushes out to where the salt is because water follows stuff around. The snail dies a horrible dehydrated death. Take a snail and put it in something with a lower concentration, like a deionized water or something where there's nothing, and water will start to go into the snail because now there's more on the inside than there is on the outside. That's hypotonic. So hypotonic, the solution has less in it than what's inside the cell. Let's see what that looks like with red blood cells. Here is your red blood cell in plasma. That's an isotonic solution. Here it is in salt water, a hypertonic solution. So there's a lot of salt out here, and the water leaves the cell to go out to where all that salt is. In a hypotonic solution, we have the opposite issue here. So now water goes into the cell because there's more stuff in the cell than there is outside. All right, tonicity. So this is all passive transport. Again, none of this requires any energy. Everything's moving from high to low concentration. Now, active transport requires energy either directly or indirectly. And there are two types of active transport, straight up active transport and vesicular transport. So let's look at just straight up active transport. We have what's called primary and secondary active transport. We're moving stuff against the gradient, meaning it's going from low to high concentration. Primary active transport is super easy to understand. It's a pump. It directly uses ATP energy to pump something against that gradient. 
sometimes more than one thing simultaneously. The most important example of this is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. This pumps three sodium out and two potassium in. This is in all your cells in your body. It's going to set up a situation for secondary active transport, it sets up this gradient that's important for your nervous system, for your uh, muscles, for your heart, um, for most everything else to work. So here's our sodium potassium ATPase pump. Sodium that's on the inside of the cell, yellow, binds. We use the energy of ATP to change the shape of this protein, and that sodium gets shoved out. We pump three sodium out, and then we pump two potassium back in. So there's a lot of sodium out here, and a lot of potassium in here. Sodium, potassium, ATPase pump. Secondary action transport then uses that gradient to move something else. So now you shoved a lot of sodium outside the cell. Sodium would like to get back in, and we can use that to push something else into the cell. That's secondary active transport. This it will be co-transport, moving something, more than one thing at the same time. It can be in the same direction or in opposite directions. Here is the sodium glucose co-transport. So much sodium out here. It would like to come in. This sodium glucose import is right here. So sodium and glucose both bind, it changes shape and brings it in. Notice there's no ATP directly used over here, but without the ATP that was burned back in primary active transport, you don't get this. So this still required ATP, just indirectly. Secondary active transport. Vesicular transport is just what it sounds like. It's moving a vesicle. These are big, capsulated things. Um, this requires ATP. This will include exocytosis and endocytosis and transcytosis and uh, phagocytosis and pinocytosis. All of these are types of vesicular transport, and that makes them all active transport. I'm not worried about protein uh, receptor or like facilitated diffusion or sorry, um, receptor mediated active transport or um, receptor mediated endocytosis or any of this. Plathrin coated pits, none of this. Phagocytosis, right? Cell eating. Phenocytosis, cell drinking. Endocytosis, just bringing something into the cell, often receptor mediated like that. Exocytosis, excreting something from the cell, a hormone, a neurotransmitter, something. So here's that. So here again is all your active processes. Now, because of this, because we pump three sodium out and only two potassium back in, and that potassium is going to start leaking pretty quick, we now create what's called potential. Potential is the difference in charge between the inside and the outside of the cell. We pumped out more positives than we put back in. So the outside of the cell now is more positive than the inside of the cell, and that is potential. So here is that. The sodium potassium pump is always pumping sodium out, potassium in, but that potassium is going to leak back out so that the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside of the cell. More on potential later when we need it. The cell interacts with everything around it. We've got these cell adhesion molecules and the glycocalyx. Again, right now, I'm not overly concerned with this. Lots of things from membrane receptors, signaling, these G protein receptors, lots of chemical signals. And we'll talk about those once we get to the nervous system. Here is a G protein linked receptor where the uh, ligand, the first message, the chemical signal, binds to its receptor and sets off this chain reaction in the cell. Now, everything inside the cell membrane is in the cytoplasm. So the cytosol is like the juice, and we've got all these organelles. As we talk about these organelles, your focus should be on what does that do. I don't care how it does it, but you do need to know what it does. It's kind of like your microwave. You need to know it cooks food. Does it really matter how it does it? No. No, it doesn't. It freaking heats up your corn dogs. You're good. So organelles are sort of the same way. Do I need you to know how mitochondria make ATP through oxidative phosphorylation? No, I don't. Do I need you to know the step-by-step -step process of uh, translation of the ribosome? Nope. 
but you need to know what they do. Now, some organelles have their own membranes, some of them don't. These are your ones that have their own membranes, these don't. The mitochondria reproduce independently of the cell, actually. They're not alive, but they do have their own genetic material. You've heard of this in like every CSI thing, fashion mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria make ATP. That's your big thing. Mitochondria make ATP. Mitochondria take oxygen and glucose, make ATP. Awesome. There's mitochondria. Ribosomes. Ribosomes don't have a membrane. There's like a granule and this ribosomal RNA. Ribosomes make proteins. Ribosomes make proteins. Some of them are just floating around the cell. They're called free ribosomes. Some of them are stuck to another structure we'll look at in just a bit, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They're going to make proteins for export. The endoplasmic reticulum comes in two forms, the rough and the smooth form. And you can see the rough form here, all those little red dots on it, the smooth form over here without that. The rough endoplasmic reticulum, think of the rough endoplasmic reticulum is like a, a sweatshop where they make your shoes. Hashtag Nike. Yeah, you're welcome. I just ruined shoes for you. So anyway, so you got this sweatshop, right? And all these little kids are in there making shoes. And then they send them out for export. That's the rough end of the plastic reticulum. So you got your sweatshop here. You got these little red dots on there. Those are like your little kids making shoes. They're ribosomes. They're making proteins. They're getting paid like a nickel a week. And then those proteins are going to get shipped out. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, nothing to do with proteins because there's no ribosomes there. Ribosomes make proteins. But then it's got ribosomes stuck to it, it's involved in making proteins. The smooth ER, no ribosomes, no proteins. Functions of smooth ER, stuff like detox and storage of minerals, um, stores calcium and uh, the muscle involved in absorbing stuff in other systems. So yeah, just depending on the cell, the smooth and the plasma reticulum might have a different function. The Golgi apparatus is like FedEx. So your little kids make your, your or your ribosomes make your proteins in your rough in the plasma reticulum sweatshop. And what's going to happen? Well, now you send it to the shipper. That's the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is going to stack this up and uh, package it and wrap it in tissue paper and ship it out. So there's your Golgi apparatus. So here you see the products being made, packaged up at the rough ER, sent to the Golgi apparatus, that repackages it and sends it to where it needs to go. One of the destinations might be a lysosome. A lysosome is a digestive organelle. It makes like acids and enzymes and crap that digest stuff inside the cell. All of these things share membrane. We call it the endomembrane system, and that picture is actually really decent for that because you can see the membrane that shared the little bubble forms there and then it joins the Golgi. The little bubble forms there and then it joins the cell membrane or it joins the lysosome. They're all sharing membranes. So that is the endomembrane system. And you can see another view of that here. Peroxisomes are other digestive organelles that are there for detox or neutralizing stuff. What's not normally drawn in any of these cell diagrams is a structure that's sort of in the background called the cytoskeleton. This is going to be how stuff moves around inside the cell, how the cell itself moves around, and it's going to hold the cell together. Microfilaments are made of a protein called actin. They're attached to the sides of the cell membrane. They're involved in moving the cell, changing the shape of the cell, and moving stuff in and out of the cell. Here we see the microfilament network. Intermediate filaments are like these big ropes that hold cells together. They attach the desmosomes so that we resist that tension. So here is the intermediate filament. Microtubules, these hollow tubes, this is like a, a, a monorail system built into your cells. The, the microtubules form this system, this network, <coughs> and when stuff inside the cell needs to move, it's going to hop on these microtubule highways. So here's a microtubule, and here's this network form. In order to move along the microtubule highway, you've got to have a car, and those cars are called motor molecules. 
Here's the motor molecule, the little green thing. It attaches, in this case, the receptors of that vesicle, and then it moves along the microtubule highway. Moves that throughout the cell. We'll talk more about this when we talk about cell motility. Look at the muscles. Microtubules come from this thing called the centrosome. The centrosome makes microtubules. It looks like this. The centrosome is always drawn like it belongs on a religious candle. I don't know why. Some cells have little extensions called cilia and flagella. They move. They have microtubules and motor molecules, and they move. I'm not worried about the 9 plus 2 arrangement here. But here is the movement of cilia. The movement of mucus. Here's the, oh, sorry, I skipped the slide. Microvilli are very similar to that, but they don't move. Microvilli are extensions of the cell that increase the surface area of the cell. <coughs> You're going to find microvilli in places that are specialized for absorption. So now you see those little microvilli. Oh, that's a loss of surface area. It's created by that. The nucleus is the genetic house for everything. Oh, DNA, right, is there. Um, not all cells have a nucleus. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus. Most cells have one, but skeletal muscle cells and some other cells will have more than one. There's our nucleus. The nuclear envelopes, the membrane around the nucleus. And that dark body in the middle is called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is where ribosomes are made. Chromatin is these strands of DNA wrapped around these proteins. They're arranged in nucleosomes, and they condense in the chromosomes when the cell's ready to divide. So here you see that condensation into this chromosome. The cell cycle is a series of changes that happen from beginning to end, or from, from when the cell forms to when it duplicates itself. This includes what's called interphase and then mitosis. I don't expect you to remember the phases of mitosis. Interphase is normal cell life, cells chilling, doing whatever <coughs> cells do. Growing, metabolizing, whatever. Gap one is this growth phase. The S phase is when it makes a copy of DNA, and gap two is when it gets ready to divide. Some cells don't have all those. Some cells are in this gap zero phase. The gap zero phase, that happens in cells that will never divide. They don't undergo mitosis. They're amitotic. So here's our big cell cycle. This is interphase. Interphase is the point that we're looking at the cells usually. So the first thing that happens here, DNA makes a copy of itself. We're not going to get into DNA helicase and the semi-conservative replication and the three prime, the five prime, whatever we're not doing this. The result of DNA replication is a copy of the DNA. Here's what that looks like. Then we enter mitosis. Now Cells that are in the gap zero phase, amitotic cells, include neurons, skeletal muscle cells, and heart muscle cells. You're not getting any new ones. So, cell division, mitosis, cytokinesis, four phases of mitosis. Again, I don't care that you remember these phases. Prophase is what prophase looks like. The chromosomes, nucleus falls apart, these little microtubules attach. Metaphase, the chromosomes line up in the middle. Anaphase, uh, the chromosomes get uh, pulled apart. Telophase, chromosomes stop moving and the new nucleus forms around them. And then the cell splits, that's cytokinesis. Mitosis gives you two identical cells. Mitosis is how you grow. Mitosis is how you heal. What's important for mitosis, partly, is that your cells know when to divide. This is a go signal. When the cell gets too big, or when there are chemicals applied that will signal the cell to grow, they undergo mitosis just as important as the stop signal that tells the cells, okay, it's, now it's time to stop dividing. If cells don't stop dividing, well, that's cancer. DNA is a giant blueprint for making proteins. 
A gene is, of course, the DNA with a blueprint for one protein. Every three letters on that big DNA thing codes for a protein. Here is the master thing, DNA, RNA, protein, transcription, translation. DNA, RNA, protein, transcription, translation. So go back to my sweatshop analogy. There's your ribosome, little kid working in the sweatshop. That little kid can't read. He's working in a sweatshop. The DNA is the master blueprint. You're not taking that thing out of the office. So what you have to do is you've got to make a copy of it. You've got to transcribe it. While you're at it, might as well write it in a language that the stupid little kids can understand. So you transcribe it as, transcribe that DNA as messenger RNA. You take it out. Then the ribosomes, the workers, translate that code into a protein. DNA, RNA, protein, transcription, translation. Transcription takes place here. Translation takes place here. Messenger RNA carries the instructions out to the ribosome. Ribosomal RNA is part of the ribosome. Transfer RNA brings amino acids in to be incorporated. Transcription takes the DNA code and turns it into messenger RNA. We get um, RNA polymerase, RNA unwants. I'm not worried about this. Messenger RNA. So there's RNA transcription, whatever. Translation takes that code and translates it into a protein. The genetic code is represented by every three letters on the DNA strand, a codon, which is the complementary base sequence on the messenger RNA. There's your DNA code, or your, well, this is messenger RNA. So these are all the codons. Every one of these is an amino acid. These are the codes for it. Notice that there's like four or six different things that code for this one amino acid, arginine. What that is is redundancy that's built into the code so that if something random weirdly mutates that little u to a c in you, you still get the same amino acid. You're good. Translation is taking that messenger RNA and translating it into a protein at the ribosome. Again, I'm not worried about how this happens. You should know that translation taking messenger RNA and translating that information into a protein and that it happens at the ribosome. The rough endoplasmic reticulum again is involved in making proteins that are going to be exported. Here's what that looks like. So you see that protein here and then it's exported. There's other DNA introns and stuff that we don't quite understand. Cells that have things that don't work, lysosomes break those down. They can help ubiquitin tax things that aren't needed. You're not just made of cells, though. There's a lot of junk outside the cells, fluid, secretions, what's called the extracellular matrix, this mesh that holds everything together. Interestingly, all the cells in your body have the same DNA. They're not the same. This is because not all that DNA strand is expressed. Not all the cells in your body express that whole genetic code. Skin cells express a certain part. Intestinal cells express a certain part. But the whole code is there. There are chemical signals in development that turn some of the genes on and off. Even later in life, steroids turn parts of the genes on and off. Testosterone hits and facial hair starts to grow. That DNA for facial hair was there the whole time. But it doesn't start working until you apply the testosterone. That DNA is built into everyone. You have a female testosterone growing facial hair. It activates that part of the DNA. 
Cells get old, cells wear out. Cells wear out, there's wear and tear, there's autoimmune disorders, and then eventually that your cells have a limited number of times they can divide. We're not gonna get into telomeres and that three prime to five, three prime to five prime bit again. All right, so there's cells. The next lecture you want is histology, and that will do it for this first unit. So from here, you want histology.